Investing insights with Right Property Group. Exploring trends in real estate and helping property investors gain financial security. G'day everybody, Steve Waters, Victor Kumar, back again for another Investing Insights with Right Property Group, where we're going to talk about all things topical, Mm -hmm. that's relevant at the moment, uh, as well as what we've seen happen in the market over the the last couple of weeks, because COVID continues to perpetuate. And I think in some cases, it's not as bad, or the economic results is not as bad as what potentially people would forecast. And in other areas, it may have been a little different as well. Yeah, and the doom and gloom predictions aren't quite panning out as they were saying that it'll pan out. And uh, it was still early days uh, at this stage because um, there's still a lot of moving parts uh, still out there that, that need to all come together for us to see a real um, uh, crystal ball stuff in the property market. But uh, as long as we stick to the fundamentals and to stick with um, a planned progression, in terms of whether you're doing it for a, um, uh, you know, a, a progression for a year, three years, 10 years, and, and uh, with, with what we do in terms of designing a decade, it will all pan out because this is just but, uh, but a small hitch in the process. I'm actually glad you brought that up, the design a decade. It is something that we are continually questioned about, about the design a decade. Mm. How does it work? What does it look like? And what's the first step? And maybe we'll talk about that if we get the time today, mm-hmm. a little bit more about that. If not, we'll dedicate a full uh, podcast. Absolutely. But we've got we've got an important guest who's been around for more than a decade, Steve. He's, and, uh, he's been around for many decades. Uh, good friend of mine and CEO of BMT, uh, Bradley Beer. Welcome. Boys, great to be here as always. Uh, yeah, a couple of decades at BMT. Uh, I haven't been around that many decades. Well, it's, it, uh, <laughs> I don't know. I you thought your age well, man. Yeah, I thought he was the oldest at the table. It, um, <laughs> but he's certainly been around a long time and, and I thought today would be a good opportunity to get him on. We'll talk obviously around about depreciation because that's what you do uh, and it wouldn't be a day go past that we don't get the questions mm-hmm. and you know, some of it's a little, all of it really is out of our... Uh, above our pay grade to answer, there's my disclaimer, um, <laughs> properly. But we'll also, I, I thought it'd be really good because everybody does hear about you and depreciation and that's all they think you do. Uh, but we'll, we'll touch on you as an investor, um, the good, the bad, the ugly, some of the mistakes, some of the wins, uh, and of course, maybe some tips and advice uh, along the way. So let's kick it off. Um, we won't go into the market update mm-hmm. today because you can tune in to one of our Facebook lives where that's more um, potentially relevant to the right there and then. Uh, but let's kick off with some depreciation questions and what it is and how it works and should you get it? Because as much as there is so much rhetoric out there that you should always you know, have a depreciation report done or speak to the experts, it amazes me just how many people don't like on a weekly basis i would have someone should i should i get a depreciation report and it's just not the investor it could also be the advisors around them as well that that might not um, bring it out to to the uh, full extent because one of the things as part of investing is that we need to be knowing all the little bits and pieces not necessarily yourself but have the right advisors around you to actually pull that all together well it's part of the the team Mm. Yeah, the, the experts. And look, on the, uh, it, we'll, we'll get into what it is and those things, I guess, in a moment. But on the should I, and that's probably the, uh, a, a very regular question is should I get one? They're asking you, they're asking their advisor. I'd change that to should I ask the question if there's any money there that I can claim? Because that's what it is. <laughs> At the end of the day, that's what it's about. We're not doing it to you know, create a paper stop. We want the money. Absolutely. And, and any, any us or any other quantity surveyor should be able to answer the should I based on whether or not there's going to be money there or not before they go and do anything that costs any money. So the question is almost, should I make a phone call and ask the person that knows? And, and that's, mm-hmm. it, it is as easy as that. You don't have to pay the money up front, dare I say it, to get a general answer. It's, it's just some clear direction. And it's just well worth it. We were talking earlier on about if you own property, there's a pretty good chance that you've got a loan attached to it. And if you've got a loan attached to it, there's a pretty good chance that you've got a job. And if you've got a job, you pay tax. And whilst we know that, you know, for sort of beating the sort of drum again, that it's not a, it's not a strategy, it, it is your God-given right to minimise and get a deduction here and there. So why not 
actually have a go at it. Absolutely. Well, God given right or otherwise, the rules say that uh, these things, depreciation or whatever they are, have some sort of deduction attached and I don't know, do you just like giving your money to the tax office? Or yeah, <laughs> like exactly, right? There's so a bunch of rules, claim them. <laughs> mm-hmm. and, and, and there it is because there is a bunch of rules and the rules have changed over the last couple of years and you know, even this time last year. You know, there was a lot of potential changes uh, that were due should we not have had a result in terms of the election that we, we have had. Um, but that's history now. So let's start it off then. What are, what are some of the, the rules that people may not be aware of that have changed over the last couple of years? Look, uh, rules, and I guess, you know, we, we, we jumped in and didn't explain what depreciation is there for a moment. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> We don't um, like to go in order, Brad. It's well, you know, um, <laughs> that's the way we rule. Rules kind of need an understanding, and maybe a, a step back to look. Depreciation is fundamentally quite a simple concept where um, things wear out uh, and decline in value over time. And if it's a property used for investment, then the tax office allows to make a deduction for those things. Um, the, the, the correlation really easily is a car. We buy a car, we drive it out. It's worth less money tomorrow. If we use that car for business, then we get to claim some deduction against that, which is depreciation. Property, very similar. Uh, If it's used for investment, then uh, the things are wearing out and we get to claim some deduction over time. The difference there is we all understand a car goes down in value very quickly and we're buying properties to increase or appreciate in value. I'm glad you made that distinction, Brad. (laughs) I thought, where's he going with this? We know about cars, we know about boats, we know they all go down in value. (laughs) Yes, Uh, we do. The property itself, we want to appreciate in value, but your bricks and mortar, your carpets and the things in there, they decline in value over time, it wear out, and the tax office says, let's make a deduction for the wear and tear on these things. Not a cash deduction, a non-cash deduction, so it does, it's a deduction you get to make that you don't pay out every year, and that's what makes it the lucrative deduction, which deductions mean more cash back in our pockets. And that's a really good point that you've made, it's a non-cash Deductions, so you literally don't have to spend it before you claim it. That's correct. It's, you know, my bricks are wearing out. Um, I've bought the property. I get to claim some deduction or for the items that are applicable in there over time. Yeah. And so rather than now answering, because you've put me in a different direction. Sorry. Rather than, that's all right. <laughs> rather than answering what are the rules that change, let's then dig a little deeper then in terms of these deductions and, and make, have an explanation around, say, division and Division 43, and without me trying to make it sound complicated, let's just explain what those two yeah, things are. Yeah, very, um, very, let's just try to make that nice and simple. And uh, it does actually bring in to make the changes easy to explain, Steve. So I knew where I was going. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. Uh, now, there's two components. Uh, one is a claim against the structure of the building. The hard stuff, concrete floors, walls, roof, the things that last a long time. That's the Division 43, if you want fancy tax office names for it. Um, now, this this is a, a related to the construction cost at the time it was built. Uh, and being the hard stuff, it's worth a fair bit, um, but it needs to be built after certain dates, 1987 for a residential property now. Uh, it's 2.5% of the construction cost each year. But that's the one that sort of produces a fair few of the dollars uh, over time, but does have some age requirements. The other part is... Uh, that what they call the plant and equipment or Division 40 for the tax office terms. Um, uh, they call it chattels or whatever else. Um, things like carpets, hot water services. Stoves. Stoves, blinds, curtains, air conditioners. If you get the theme, it's things that don't last as long. Mm. So you get to claim these things quicker. The tax office puts on them what's called an effective life. They think that a stove should last 10 years or 12 years, depending on the legislation time. Uh, and, and so you get to sort of claim them over that period as opposed to the building itself, 2.5%, which is actually a 40-year claim. So the two main areas uh, are those um, around, and this is where I guess the changes especially come in of uh, a couple of years ago, uh, 2017, 9th of May to be exact, uh, <laughs> etched in my mind. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Um, the, these changes that they made meant that prop owners that bought second-hand property can't claim on those plant and equipment items. So you now buy a second-hand property since that date. Uh, you can't sort of make a claim for a stove, whether it's one year old, 10 years old, 12 years old. Uh, that legislation suddenly says that your stove's worth nothing uh, and there's no claim against that. 
Um, so, I mean, that's the key part of that change, I suppose. Uh, yeah. It it's, doesn't apply to new property. It doesn't apply to commercial property. It doesn't apply to things you add to the property yourself afterwards. The key point around that is there's, there's, that change is a big one. There's many changes over the time. And I, I'll even step back to the start of it. Ask us the question. Let's see if there's some deductions available. Um, in order to do your number crunching exercise up front when you're buying a property, it's a good to have a bit of understanding of what that's about. But mostly, is there any deductions available on this property or not? Uh, hello, ring, ring, Kwanu Surveyor. Yeah. And, and we'll give you an indication really easily. And it doesn't cost you anything except the phone call, of course. It's, and it is as simple as that. And, and once again, whilst we don't, you know, we don't suggest that the outcome of that should determine potentially the outcome of whether you should buy or not, it's money, it is potentially money on the table that is part of the equation, mm -hmm. whether you like it or not. And look, I'm the depreciation guy here and I don't, I'm not, I've never said that you should go and buy this type of property because it gets more depreciation. Depreciation is a part of the cash flow, which is part of the, the piece of buying property. Uh, it, it shouldn't be your reason either way, the fundamentals of why you buy something that is going to appreciate in value. Uh, and make you wealth and money over time should be what drives decisions rather than just tax outcomes, which is depreciation, even said by the depreciation guy. Yeah, we often, we, we actually, <laughs> when we're giving commentary around sort of property, we always preface it by saying, look, we don't want to sound like those property guys. <laughs> You've just done the equivalent of I'm not that depreciation guy, which even is... no, I am. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Which, but it's the, it's the truth at the end of the day. But if I go back just to, to one of the, the statements there, one of the things you talked about um, where the rules change, where you know, if it's had a renovation and you've bought it in that capacity, well, there's just no deduction on that portion of it for you unless you do the renovation yourself. So the renovation, uh, there'll be no deduction on a second-hand plant and equipment item, but if someone puts in a new kitchen and bathroom that fits in Division 43, it's, the rules didn't change. So the, de Ooh, the, good point. the building allowance component you still get. And this is, oh, you know, we, we brush over the change a little bit sometimes, but that's why you call and ask the question because we'll ask, well, okay, it's got a stove that's two years old, but did it have a new kitchen five years ago? Because mm. there'd be some claim for that kitchen five years ago that's been done by a previous owner. Uh, if the previous owner has done a substantial renovation and the rules are pretty tough on this, they need to kind of change every room mm. and then sold you the property it could be treated for the purpose of this legislation as a new property, uh, even though it's not new, but for the purpose of this. So you may be able to claim the plant and equipment uh, even if you didn't do the renovation. Any, The rules are pretty tough. It's, yeah, that's, a, a, a new kitchen, bathroom and a lick of paint is not it's not going to do it. <laughs> so if I, sorry, if I, if I ask the question, only because a client came to mind the other day, or as you said that I should say, where – They've purchased a property that has had a substantial renovation, so not structural, but they've bought it with a new bathroom, like obvious new bathroom, completely renovated, new kitchen, paint, flooring, curtains, you know, lights, switches, like it was a full reno. And be very general here, because I know you have to be, but in that, in that instance what depreciation would be allowable? Because there is, there is a bit of a miscommunication here, whereas, mm -hmm. well, no, it's... it's you didn't do the renovation, you don't get to claim it because it's built in 1970 as an example. Yes. So walk us through that one. So you have bought that. This person that renovated it, the vendor, uh, renovated it, we'll assume they used it for a period of time to mm -hmm. make it, make it um, be affected by these changes. Uh, and you buy it now. Look, great renovation being done only a couple of years ago. You know, it's really good. Um, the claims for you as an investor now, if you buy that property, uh, there'll be no claims on plant and equipment items. So if the stove's two years old and the curtains, the blinds, well, I think you said curtains there, there'll be a stove <laughs> in the kitchen. Uh, there <laughs> might fashion. be a new, uh, new air conditioning system there. This legislation means that you would get to claim nothing for those. But we still go in and the, the, t the hard cost, the Division 43 component, uh, the new kitchen benches, bench top, bathroom, tiles, um, everything else that's hard, I suppose you'd say, pretty much. We put a, uh, a cost on that at the time it was done and you get to make deductions for that. Now, it's not as many as it would have been in the past in that situation, but if you get five grand instead of seven grand, five grand still good. It's, it's still a win. <laughs> is, there, is there a time limit to that renovation uh, as to when it has to be done? 
So it falls under those start same Division 43 rules where it needs to be uh, built after 1987 to start with and if it's structure improvements improvements are mm-hmm. done after 1992. So even someone that's renovated something, you buy something that's renovated 15 years ago, uh, you've still got potentially some deductions available there, even if you're missing out on that, that uh, second-hand plant and equipment. Mm. Uh, so... Yeah. There's some dates that matter, but it's almost uh, it's still, it's for a fair while those those renovations do happen. So a, a good example would be uh, an older property. So let's say it was it was pre eighty uh, seven, and uh, the vendor has at some point in time put down put in a pool um, or put on a granny flat. That would all comply, isn't it? Absolutely, as long as it's been done after the appropriate dates. Mm-hmm. Uh, then yeah, the pool, the granny flat uh, would would have some deductions available. And while I think it's really important that people have some knowledge and understanding around depreciation don't get too bogged down into it because remember it's not Mm. the reason so the easiest answer is just to give you a ring i mean even earlier than that you can uh we've got an app that's just for depreciation calculator or a depreciation calculator on the website you can actually go in and put a bit of information about the property in there and it spits you out an approximate based on the information you put in there if it's got some renovations and a bit difficult, then the next thing is you give us a call and we'll have a discussion about it and we'll give you an indication of a range over the phone of what sort of deductions we'd expect. You see what he did there? He said, mm-hmm. go to the calc first. Yep. Said, don't blow my blow the phone lines up. <laughs> <laughs> well, the, the calc- Brad, can I? <laughs> the calc you can do at midnight by yourself. Exactly, um, you can do it at midnight. Look, you you, you send it, flick us a, a um, uh, where it's for sale on the portals. You flick us a, a, a something that says, oh, I'm thinking about this one, Brad. Um, what do you think? If you do 100 of those to me um, and you never buy one, I'll start thinking, how about you use the calculator first? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and <laughs> fair point too. It's so free, the, you know. Yeah, it is. And there's a few other calcs you got there. you got um, the prop calc. The prop calc. Yep. Uh, look, I'm a firm believer in making sure you crunch your numbers before you buy anything. Absolutely. And, and over, over the years, we, we've always done sort of estimates of how much depreciation you might get. Uh, and then people go, well, how do I work out the rest of the numbers? I'm like, well, we're not your accountant. Um, we're not the guy that works out those numbers. We're not mm. going to give you financial advice. But we did uh, a, a few years ago build something called PropCalc, which is really a, I mean, at the end of the day is a calculator of the rest of those numbers. Um, and we made it something that's quite simple. Um, we got a you know, methodology signed off by accountings, Deloitte's, um, and it drags in a depreciation estimate for you um, and if you enter the address of a property uh, it'll drag whatever data it can in regards to median prices for rent and things you go in there and address all your own numbers your tax rate what you think you're going to pay for insurance etc and it spits you out a, an after-tax cash flow uh, on, a, on a particular property you're looking at it's a really it's a good calc too because it um, and I'm not trying to sort of yeah be in your corner here and saying just how good it is but it is good I played with it the other day um, and whilst we have something that's very similar in terms of our cash flow sheets when we do our analysis, we never take into account the tax or the depreciation or any of that. So it's a pre-tax sheet, if you will. This just takes it to the next level should you want to play around with your rate That's right. and have a little bit of depreciation in it. So it's, it's for anyone who's listening that hasn't used it um, when you're potentially doing the analysis on a property, jump on. It's, it's very good. And it, it, look, the, the build of that was a very simple thing where people are asking us how to use the number all the time and we go, well, let's build something that helps them use the number. Yeah, because uh, it is that. It's about the numbers at yes. the end of the day. You can compare them, save them, so you can compare different properties as well. If you're um, looking at two or three different properties, it gives you a little report on the different properties and, and uh, compares them to each other. Great, great little tool to – everything about investing is about – understanding what you're buying, what you're doing, why you're doing it, and crunching your numbers. And that's just a simple way to do it. It is. So let's now go to the report because I know when I get my reports, they're about 40 pages long or or thereabouts, and (laughs) I'm only looking for the one table, which is what's relevant to me. So just maybe explain to the listeners and what is involved, or sorry, what, what is in the report that is pertinent to them. So there's 40 pages of fantastic information, Steve. Sorry. I re- <laughs> <laughs> well, there is. It just depends on how many times you want to read it. Uh, yeah, so now when you, when you understand, at, at the end of the day, we've got to um, explain the methodology, what Correct. we've done, and all those sorts of things. 
The reason there's lots of pages as well is that there's different methods you can claim under uh, and, you know, diminishing value, prime cost, a low value pool in diminishing value, etc. cetera, um, and these things are projected for 40 years. Uh, we, depending on the type of uh, income you get and what your situation is, you may use different of those numbers. So even though I could say, look, there's one number to claim each year, which there is, but depends on which method you want to use as to which page you've got to go to. So, so what he just did there, he, he, he cornered me and he just highlighted my <laughs> inattention to detail and concentration span. But no. it's but it's very true because there is all these different pieces in there. Having said that, the accountant will be the one that is interpreting it for you and explaining it. Look, and most of the time you'll end up claiming diminishing value because that's what gets the most money at the start. And there um, it is. <laughs> <laughs> um, the, it, you may do something different if you know you're going to have a higher income tax bracket in three years' time or something like that. Yeah. You know? um, but generally, we're looking for money as soon as we can. I don't know about you, but that's me. Um, oh, yeah. Time value of money today and, and the fact that I want more in my pocket to put in my offset accounts. Uh, and uh, so there's one page that will tell you the total claim uh, for Division 40 and Division 43 separated that comes up with one number in the first year you bought the property and that projects that number out every year. You kind of need this, depending on who, who's doing your tax return, you might enter some, you know, two or three numbers each year in a separate spot. Uh, but there's uh, one thing that projects out the total claim each year, and that's really the important piece of information. It is. <laughs> and so is there a, um, well, you do have a document that maybe a, a quasi sort of report, so to speak, where you'll have some explanations around it that... Uh, you can send us, and if people want that, it's uh, Vic, questions at questions at, at, right, at property right Property Group, and we'll make that a, available, uh, um, which will have a full explanation around the port, because even someone that really doesn't care, they just want the number, uh, should have some understanding about what they're looking at, because yeah. it is a big piece of the jigsaw puzzle. And it's a lot of reading to go through if you don't want to. Look, you, you need to know you've got the right number, I suppose. And look, your accountant will generally find the right number, but a bit of understanding is not bad. So we'll, get, we'll um, provide that to you so you can, so that, you know, here's the, I suppose, the the guide to how to find the right number for me. Um, very easy. So I'll provide that to you guys so you can uh, give it to anyone. Awesome. So that's questions at Right Property Group. So we do have a few questions here that we've compiled over the last couple of days, or seven days to be precise, which you can answer for us. Um, and answer it well compared to what we would. Uh, so the first question is, I've recently purchased a property that was built in 1980 and has had a significant reno. Can I claim the depreciation? I think you kind of answered that earlier on. Um, answer is depends. Ring yeah, Brad. Uh, well, it depends. But if it's been um, built, built pre the dates that matter and someone's renovated it later on, it'll come down to... And, and when, when you say... When we say call and have a discussion... We also want to make sure that not only will be – we don't want to work out, you know, you, you pay $700 and you'll get $15 a year in depreciation. We want to make sure it's actually a viable exercise for you to Correct. go through, right? So yep. the depends is depends how much they've actually spent on that renovation. And with the photos that come off the portal um, from when you've bought the property or whatever you've got, we'll be able to get a bit of a rough number together in our minds that we believe because – we, we clicked over just a couple of weeks ago 700,000 depreciation schedules, which is a you know, really? great... Really? 700,000? 700,000. So with that many, we should have a little bit of an idea of what sort of deductions are going to be there based on a bit of a look at a property uh, so, uh, without having to go through the whole exercise first. 700,000, that's huge. Yeah. That's a lot of... Because you physically go through the properties as well, not like you, well, the team does. It's not a... Um, it's not a no. It's just not just done. We we've got a team all over the country. There's a couple of hundred staff that that um, go and visit all these properties and and measure up and estimate. So we can, I mean, our job is to get as much as we can out of it, make sure it's legitimate deductions, and are not going to site to do that. How do I find if you've got a fantastic, awesome, um, greatly built property that costs more to build in the day it was built? Mm -hmm. That's a good um, point. And identify all the items in there. So How did you go with COVID? Did that um, restrict? access for a point in time? So we thought it might. Uh, we followed the government's rules. When they shut open inspections in this country, I thought, well, that's a step in the wrong direction uh, mm. as far as us getting the jobs are concerned. But I mean, number one's the safety of our people and the people we're with. Um, we operated through that with 
Uh, we did things like all our guys in the car have got a hand-washing station, they've got sanitizer, they've got masks, they've got gloves. But the thing is, probably the one thing I think is that we asked whether anyone's been overseas, we asked whether everyone's had a cough, et cetera. Mm. I think we don't really need to touch anything if we get the tenant that we meet there to open every door and turn every light on. Correct. So we walk into the house, we touch nothing except the floor with our feet mm. uh, and make sure we stay away from everybody. And so we were able to operate um, quite well through that. Uh, That's good. There was a few people that, you know, if there's someone sick, we couldn't do that. We explained to the client it might take some more time. Uh, and, I mean, well, I had some problems in across borders where I can't move my guys around. So mm. um, uh, some of those spots were a little hard. Uh, but we're getting through all of those uh, now. Uh, and and been, uh, been able to move people around, not interstate borders, of course. We've got to stick by the rules. But there was, a, there was a few people in the first couple of weeks that sort of went, no, no, we don't want you to come in because of COVID. We had a, made a status in our job board that said on, on hold for COVID. Uh, and after a little bit, they, they got back into the world and went, well, people are going to come through our house and do things yeah. and uh, get the economy, keep the economy moving. And, and so it was, it was for a short time that we actually had a problem with that. Yeah, well, I think we, we nearly got, well, we did get stuck in Perth mm. for a little bit, but we had so many inspections that were just cancelled on us because of that fear. And, and look, I don't begrudge anybody doing that. I was probably a little bit that way. Yeah, we had to cut our trip uh, short because uh, we were concerned about the borders closing back then. Yeah, we didn't want to get caught in uh, Perth. I mean, there's worse places to get caught. You know, good fishing. Bit away from your family, though. It would, yeah, that's <laughs> yeah, it's not good. That's not good. Yeah. Um, all right, next question. What depreciation is available to me on a granny flat that I have just built? It cost me 147000 and I earn circa $130,000 a year. Yeah. Uh, $147,000 build on a granny flat. Oh, look, rough numbers in head without seeing anything other than that. Um, you're probably looking five to $7,000 a year in the first few years and diminishing over time. Uh, and I guess the, the important thing, I guess, around that is what does that mean? And the fact that they've given us a, uh, um, an amount of uh, income there gives us a tax rate. So we can correlate that back to some dollars, uh, mm. really. So maybe uh, let's let's make it simple um, for round numbers and call it five thousand two hundred dollars in the first year of depreciation because that's a hundred dollars a week. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> that's easy. Um, and so that hundred dollars a week, without having considered everything else that exists, um, the depreciation wear and tear is about a hundred dollars a week on that property. That tax rates at thirty seven cents in the dollar, are roughly. We've got Medicare and a few things that mess that up, but let's call it thirty seven cents in the dollar. Um, means that that person would get um, thirty-seven dollars a week back in additional tax because of that depreciation, without having spent it. Without having spent it, that's right. And so I, I think that's a really valid point here because you just reverse engineered that back to a dollar uh, a dollar a week or a weekly uh, dollar amount. And and why I think it's really important is because we should know what all our rents are, mm. and usually. It is a bit state dependent. We know what it is per week. So when you can just psychologically then put something up beside it, which is on top of that, it just makes it easier to digest. And don't ever forget that a dollar saved is a dollar forty earned. And people tend to concentrate too much on the rent. Well, I'll put my rent up by ten dollars a mm-hmm. week as opposed to well, I'll negotiate my rates for twenty dollars a week or you know, get some depreciation done, which is or, or get a depreciation that that, 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 I mean, the average deduction out of something we, we did last financial year was about $8,000 in the first year, uh, and there was a large number of them. That, that's lower than average because it's a granny flat. It costs mm. less to build. Uh, but, you know, at 30, well, try putting your rent up by $37 a week in a granny flat uh, mm. and see if it's vacant. And that's the point, right? <laughs> like try putting really anything up by 37 and not even just today, just in a normal market because you should always be around market rent anyway, so... Putting something up thirty-seven dollars a week, it's an enormous jump, and it's not very easy for a tenant to di- you know, to digest. I mean, you're putting it up at thirty-seven dollars a week, so why not get it on the flip side via a deduction or savings on the expenses? Yeah. So the, the eight thousand is fairly significant, right? I know it's an average figure. That would mean that some would get a lot more, others may get a little less. Yes. But if you if you bought a property in the last say two three years, and your accountant has said that you know. Uh, there isn't any depreciation and you haven't made that call, I would suggest that they actually do send you an email, Brad. So the, 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 it's, the, the scenario, it's, it's not the perfect scenario because they've been missing out. Mm. As far as um, us doing something for someone who rings up and says, I've, I haven't been doing this and I've 
heard this today or whatever it is, we go, well, you can easily um, go back and amend up to two years of your tax return. That's right. So if you've owned it for four years, you can only go back for two of those years. Uh, but if I can go back and I could have had $8,000, let's say that's the average for the last two years, it means a bit of cash. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I guess the important thing is don't do another tax return and miss out on one. So yeah, because then you're another... <laughs> then you're another year that you've missed. Um, uh, but, that was well, actually one of the questions that we had was how far back can I go? Um, and I actually find it a little alarming that whilst there are so many pieces of education on the internet, TV, whatever it may be around you know, tax depreciation, I'm talking within the property sphere here, that people still don't understand that it is actually there for you to to utilise yeah. and that the advice that you're getting should be parallel with the team member that you're using. That's right. But uh, on the flip side too, Steve, it's the quality of the questions you ask determine the quality of the advice, right? So one of the things I have with, with all of my properties is having a checklist to say that does the accountant have the, um, the uh, statements? Do they have the um, end of financial year statements for the rentals? And then do they have a copy of the depreciation report? Mm. Uh, and it's simple things like that. And particularly if you have um, more than a couple of properties, it can be lost in the mix. And, and you need to simplify it really uh, to a checklist to say that this is what I need to do in tax time and this is the information I need to put in front of the accountant. Because if you haven't put, put it in front of the accountant, and if the accountant normally would get one of the uh, junior members to put everything together in terms of the, uh, you know, loading up the portal and so forth, they may miss that crucial step. And before you know it, you've missed out on it and then you have to go back and amend your returns, which is also a cost in itself. Mm. And painful. Mm. So I, I, um, on that, I, I 100% agree, whether it's the checklist or otherwise. Um, and I probably, um, you know, step sideline for a moment. When, whenever we do a depreciation schedule for someone, we actually give them on, you, you mentioned portal, and that's what we think mm-hmm. about this. We give them access to a portal that we have uh, that, that, you know, the depreciation schedule's in there. If they put a new stove in, they can amend their depreciation schedule. They can also share it with their accountant if they've got a login. One thing that we just put in there to make something like that a little easier is we build an income and expenses tab. So, like, your checklist is kind of there and it's mm-hmm. in a list as per the ATO and you can actually use that, put all your costs in there and instead of your shoebox or your whatever else that some people have, there's a way against your property that you can log these things through the year and then just go share at the end of the time um, mm. uh, to mm. the accountant along with any changes you've made to your depreciation schedules. But, look, making sure you've got all those things done each time. Uh, like, you t- I mean, we, we're investing in property to make money if you, whenever you leave it on the table mm-hmm. by not doing depreciation or not putting all of the right things in there, I mean, it's just a bit silly, <laughs> really. Well, and it's, we're not buying you know, a box of pens. It's a, you know, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollar asset. You, you really do want to be extrapolating every piece of money that you're entitled to along the way and even treating it seriously. And it's got, it's got its level of complexity. It's not simple. I mean, back to your first first point why did they not why have they not done it uh, mm. and and i think often because we get these all the time because as i say it's a blessing in disguise they're going to get heaps of money they're going to love us uh, but it's because they listen to someone that said maybe it's too old mm. they yeah. listen to someone they they think their accountant looks after that um, their accountant should and does often look after um, the fact that it's a number that's needed, most of our work comes from accountants. But don't just think your accountant looks after it and not ask the question. Yeah. Don't think it's too old and not ask the question. Just ask the question. And that's probably the biggest thing. Oh, the property's too old. Shouldn't, yeah. You know, yep. I won't bother depreciating it because there's this upfront cost to, to get the report done. But still ask the question. Now, if I tell you it's too old, okay. Well, then pay attention. <laughs> <laughs> so you also don't let age be your barrier. <laughs> <laughs> We're all going to get old. <laughs> yeah, and appreciate and value it. Um, so when can it's actually one of the questions, but I'll rephrase it my way: Is a depreciation agent the only people that can create a depreciation report, or can your accountant do it? Okay, and so depreciation agent or the word you're probably looking for there is quantity surveyor. Quantity surveyor, uh, sorry. Yeah, and yeah. Uh, so, so the reason we get involved is, is 
Um, to be a quantity surveyor, I'm a, uh, I've done a building degree, construction management degree, that is, uh, that I, I come out of that with some other study um, as a quantity surveyor, which is someone who estimates construction costs of buildings. Four years of uni, I get plans, um, I can measure them up, count the bricks. We colour them in on the plans, you know, <laughs> after we do that, you know. Um, but we are a specialist in cost uh, estimating. Um, so the, the claim that you get to make relates to the construction cost and the value of items in the property. And the tax office says they'll accept an estimate for this such uh, estimate, actual costs, or an estimate by a relevant professional such as a quantity surveyor, the brick counting guy. Uh, and, and Here's so the elevator pitch. <laughs> <laughs> as opposed to the bean counter, you get the yeah, brick counter. Yeah, we're the brick counter. Uh, that's what I like to think. Um, but uh, so we, um, so there's a compliance and a risk piece there that, well, it's got to be based on some sort of construction costs. Now, if you've actually got the construction costs, the accountant can use some of those. But we actually go to site and estimate construction costs when they're not available, but also then work out what else we can do to maximise that deduction. We, like a traditional quantity surveyor that knows how to count bricks, is not a depreciation specialist necessarily. It's another science that you need to marry with that to make sure you're getting the most out of it. Going through the property is important because you're identifying everything that's there in order to cost it up properly, but also find anything you can that we can claim faster so we can get more deductions from that. Um, so we work alongside the accountant who doesn't go out and visit the property, doesn't estimate construction costs to make sure we get as much as we can out of it. I mean, talk to the accountant about a depreciation schedule. They should know what they are. They'll mm. have seen a BMT report out of 700,000, I'm sure, at some point. At one point or another, yeah. <laughs> uh, and talk to, them before, talk to them before you go ahead. We'll talk to them if need be, but they understand the process. Some of them sometimes get the age thing, thinking maybe it's mucked up and it's too old, but... But ask us the question, we'll look at the photos, we are the cost estimators that can come up and put some numbers on that that are real. And, and that's so why it comes comes back down to, I would imagine anyway, visiting the site versus looking at some photos, which you know, potentially some may do. Yeah, look, and, and look, even, look, especially in COVID, suddenly there's some people that think you can do it without an inspection. Um, I don't know, I'd like to do my jobs properly before and after mm. COVID and make sure that we're getting every deduction we can. And even if we have to wait because there's a risk of the tenant um, having an issue, um, we're better off making sure we get it done right because these deductions go for years and you want to get as many of them as you can because we're property investors trying to get the most out of these properties. It's a good point. So how long do they last for the listener? So the, the, if you've got a new property now, you've actually got a claim for 40 years. Uh, we project those numbers for 40 years. Uh, the issue around that is that, you know, in 10 years, if the stove breaks down, the depreciation schedule is wrong, but inside that my BMT portal, you can go and fix it, or we mm -hmm. can fix it, either way. Um, if you buy a property that's 20 years old, you've got 20 years of claims left, so we project the next 20 years. Um, so as long as there's depreciation available in that property is how long the report lasts, and the maximum of that is for 40 years, um, but uh, we do it depending on what the property looks like. And it's a one-off cost. It's not something that you have to pay every... Yeah, done, Every done up year. front once and uh, it projects it. it out for the rest. Excellent. All right, let's pivot a little bit because there's a gazillion other questions here, but maybe just contact BMT and they can go through it with you rather than us getting... Too technical. Well, yeah, I was trying to... <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and look, I can provide some answers there for those anyway. So exactly, exactly. So let's talk about Brad Beer himself because everybody has a story and... Everybody, especially within our yeah, realm, if you will, anyone who's property st uh, a property investor, all had to start somewhere and there was some pivotal moment for them to, to actually entertain the thought. And then most likely, the longer they've, they've been going, they've probably made a few mistakes along the way and had a few victories. Um, so let's talk about you as the, as the investor. What made you get into investing and when? Well, uh, I, I started at BMT in 1998, uh, so um, I was part way through uni. Uh, BMT, the original guys that started, uh, Brendan, Matt, and Tom. <laughs> no rocket science there. Uh, Tom was actually one of my lecturers at uni, uh, right. and said, "Do you want to come and get some work experience?" Which I needed to get my degree. Uh, and then I thought, oh, "Okay, sounds good. Uh, when do I start?" Um, and uh, the rest is history. Uh, that was in June 1998. So. Uh, um, I uh, didn't really know about depreciation very much. I wanted some work experience for my building degree. 
Uh, didn't really know much about property investing at all. Um, I come from a family up in Taree where we, you know, my parents bought their house before my older sister was born and still live in it uh, and bought that, paid it off over the years working, uh, one of four kids. Uh, and so there was no understanding that I was given um, before. I learnt uh, very quickly about depreciation, obviously, uh, mm. and then I started talking about depreciation to people and there's lots of investors that need depreciation um, started doing sessions on depreciation in places uh, back way back then. And I listened to the people, the sessions I was doing about property investing uh, and sort of it was good. I got to form an opinion, I guess, and I've continually done this ever since where there's lots of people that have got a way to do it, to make money from it. I've listened. I mean, I had the benefit of going to lots of these things and learning without having to pay. Yeah. I, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I went and did my part, uh, yeah, and yeah. Then I listened to the ideas. Uh, so the first property I bought uh, was, and I, so I started saving some money. I had no money. I was at uni, you know, on Oz study or whatever they call it now back then. Uh, so I um, uh, worked at BMT. I saved up a bunch of my deposit for the first property in two thousand and one or two. Might have been. End of 01 or early 02. Uh, it was a really old, bad four-bedroom house in a suburb called Georgetown, Newcastle area. Yeah, I know it. Uh, and uh, it was actually my, my – they weren't my partners. They were about my p- partners from 2002. I came on as a partner in BMT in 2002. So it was probably just before then. They'd started to buy some property as well. So I learned a bit for them. They went to some courses as well and talked about depreciation, as you do. Uh, and they probably pushed me, when I say pushed me, they found it. They didn't like this big shed at the back, one of my partners, and uh, ended up saying, well, we negotiated a deal. They want 200, 198. They'll take 170. Have you got enough money? It's probably time, Brad. And Because I'd been looking and starting and learning. Um, uh, so I bought that property. Uh, I renovated it. Uh, and that was my start. It wasn't about depreciation because it was built about 1910. Uh, <laughs> yeah, not a lot left in that one. <laughs> I found uh, I actually found newspapers under the floor from like 1912 or 1910 uh, that they put under the liner that they used to put uh, under the three layers of liner. Yeah, two yeah, layers of carpet, and asbestos, was actually, yeah. And asbestos and whatever. Um, so I bought that. I did a lot of renovations on that uh, straight away. Uh, it was uh, hard work up at night, you know, running stuff in the ceiling at midnight in winter. Um, I know. I do remember being cold <laughs> and uh, <laughs> putting a new bathroom and had mates help me, dad help me, etc. Uh, I bought the second one only about eight months later. Uh, I bought that one at 170. I did some internal renovations, managed to get a valuation of 240,000. Uh, Lovely. Right at the end of that. It was kind of right at the end of that market movement back Of that then. big run, yeah. Yeah. Uh, and... I then uh, had then I had some equity. Interestingly enough, they did a desktop valuation because I did no work on the outside of the house <laughs> at all. Um, <laughs> did an internal renovation, worked really hard on that. Um, got equity growth, bought a second one not far away. I still own that as well. Mayfield's the suburb. Um, paid about two twenty for it, and that was I slowed a bit then. Um, uh, and uh, probably made a mistake. Uh, if we want to talk about mistakes, I think that's... Yeah, that was actually one of the, <laughs> one of the other questions. questions, yeah. I'm waffling on too much. Uh, that's all right. I, um, I, I went surfing for the week, um, weekend back up near my hometown and bought a block of land. <laughs> ah, there it is. <laughs> Still own that block of land too. Has it got anything on it now? <laughs> no, not yet. Um, <laughs> so that, that uh, was, you know, very, very heavily sold, and it's an area I love. It's, 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 it's like the... It's the one thing that taught me about the holiday purchase that I still will always talk about now where, I mean, every time I go to the, the, the um, uh, Sunshine Coast uh, for some sort of holiday or work conference or something, especially in winter, I concoct my plan to move there or to buy something there. Yeah, don't we all? Because <laughs> mm-hmm. it's warm, you know. I was having this discussion with my wife yesterday, <laughs> funnily enough. <laughs> uh, and then, then you look at the numbers and they, 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 that, that block of land is probably the thing that I thought I'd build a house on. It's in a holiday sort of area near where I went fishing as a child um, all the time. Uh, and, and, so and a lot of emotions uh, in that purchase. There was way too much emotions in that purchase, absolutely. Um, and uh, it was probably one of the, the mistakes. The thing is it slowed me a little, but it didn't tie up too much equity to make a 
big problems. I've never sold it because I don't have to. Uh, and, and it didn't really stop me, but it did teach me a few things mm. uh, that I need to crunch numbers and do things and don't be on the way back from the beach and buy a block of land. <laughs> <laughs> Drinking beer in the hot sun all day. It, um, so, and, and you haven't built on it? Is that because you just couldn't be oh, bothered or is no, it because you can't? Haven't haven't been bothered the, the local agent probably said knows i'll sell it if there's a good dollar uh it probably is something that i could build on i just haven't had the headspace to get it done and i don't need to and it's not a big piece of the portfolio i probably should sell it or whatever it just sort of sits there at the moment um put some money in the offset account so it doesn't well it still cost me one way or the other it comes from somewhere else so that's a bad argument yeah <laughs> <laughs> you know, well, i have that one covered well, it's one thing i do complain about is it doesn't even have a tap but i get water bills <laughs> oh is that right <laughs> yes because there's water going past the front of it uh, well, there you go <laughs> uh, i'll either build it or do something with it one day it's not a not of major concern to me but it is um uh, other than it being a bit of a lesson and maybe that's well, why it's a tangible it's lesson still you can just drive past it every now and again like i do with mine and just say <laughs> Yep, wrong mistake. I do every time. <laughs> <laughs> I go up there. So that's your that's your biggest mistake. Uh, look, no, that's not a bad that's, one. That's a that's a pretty good one. Yeah, uh, but but it's I mean I, around mistakes, I've made plenty of mistakes, and I've still got some mistakes. And I think uh, my probably my next biggest mistake is not listening to my um, I guess whether you call it mantra or I guess the rules around investing that I set for myself. Mm. Um, I'm I'm a firm believer in in uh, in finance is one of the the biggest keys to investing in property and understanding um, I think uh, understanding how to work it properly uh, the property is the vessel the finances the, the money is what's important to mm. me, uh, and making sure I've always got available cash to make decisions and available cash is offset cash that I borrow against properties heavily all the time so that I can renovate I can buy good deals. And I, I can do that without having to be at the mercy of a bank, the bank, any of the banks, um, mm. making sure that I control that. There's a point, um, I went pretty hard after those and was buying and renovating and I had things going on all over the place. And I remember getting to a point once where I'm in the middle of refinancing stuff, I'm busy, work, growing a business, etc., which has been great and successful, uh, where I, I probably got... You know, you've got all this money in the offset account, but you're running three renos at once uh, and you're a bit slow on the refinance. And then you sort of get to a point and something's a bit slow and I had a big tax bill from, uh, from, from BMT that the account had missed. And I go, okay, well, I had to pay that, pay that, pay that. I go, hang on, it's running a bit skinny around here until that refinance comes through. Um, and I went through an exercise of calculating and, and going through exactly uh, how much money I had absolutely everywhere. Uh, and, and I don't... I don't think I've told this story in my life too many times, but it is. Oh, here's a scoop. <laughs> yeah, <no. laughs> uh, because you know, I mean, it was it was a, it was a long time ago. I I I I probably had been married for I've been married for fifteen years, and I'd probably been married for four or five years then. And and my wife came from a family without money as well, and uh, she said it's a great thing. We're going through every every. Um, it was like, you know, the struggle street from the start. <laughs> um, but I had properties and I had definitely refinanced dollars coming through. But I just spent too much on renovating and doing all those things without making sure you free up the cash each time. Mm -hmm. It's such an important lesson. And I, I would argue that every long-term investor that has, you know, X amount of properties in their portfolio have probably experienced that at one stage or the other. And I would even say that people have experienced that in mass in mm -hmm. the last Eight weeks, twelve weeks. Yeah, one of the things we keep saying, Steve, is that you know you, you get the money before you need it. Be liquid. Be liquid all the time. Mm -hmm. Is the bank will always give you money when you don't need it, but they're unlikely right. to give it to you when you do. Or they have. And that's slow. it. And and if you and as you just pointed out, you know you had a few. You had a tax bill. You had this. You had that. You had a few renos on the run. It's amazing how it all seems to culminate at that one time. It's that perfect yeah. storm building up. Well, this, it? it's. It's, I don't know if it's a universe thing, or it's, but the state of your wallet dictates the state of your mind. And if it's available, if it's there mm. and you need to pivot, you can do so with absolute clarity rather than being backed into a corner uh, and making some irrational decisions. So yep. be liquid, be liquid all the time. Make and sure you get to make the choices is what it comes down to that. I think liquid gives you the availability to choose. Well, okay, bank, you don't like that. Off you go um, and, uh, and, and make the decisions. You could even look at it as part of cash flow management. 
Mm. If you if you really look deep enough, I mean, other than income and expenses, liquidity is a form of cash flow management. Should it need to be used, it is, it is there. Absolutely, and it's not yeah, hard money. And and look, I think one thing with 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 property is that uh, you know when when you you get that loan, providing you can make your interest payments, uh, and and most of the time, uh, you, you're off the radar of the bank. Um, you're not. Um, it's not a, I mean, share market's got its positives and negatives, but uh, anything that's leveraged, uh, you, you've got a debt there that if it goes down, they call on. Mm. With the property, if you've got enough money to keep making the interest payments and your cash flow manage that properly, the likelihood of being foreclosed on the back, well, there's a lot of people in trouble that need, need their income every fortnight or month to actually make those payments. If you've organised your cash flow properly on your cash control of cash properly, then you shouldn't get into too many of those uh, those predicaments if you learn from the mistakes. Very, very true. And even if you go back to, and you would have experienced as well, the, the GFC, and we've often talked about mm-hmm. this, is nobody, if very few, lost money because of a lack of equity. They lost it because, lost property, that is, or got foreclosed upon from a lack of equity at a point in time. It was a lack of cash flow. Yes, being able to meet the debt, make the repayments. Mm. And had those people controlled their cash flow a little bit better, fast forward from back then to today, well, their properties have probably gone up by 100%. Right. And, and the warning signs are there well ahead of time, right? So you just need to look at um, how you're lining everything up. And, and Brady brought a really good example in terms of the refinance was coming late. You had multiple renovations happening. And now you're in a position where you could pivot and, and still still meet it, right? But if, if it was someone that didn't have that opportunity, then the people like us that will come in and buy those properties off them because they then no longer have the money to do the renovations because then they have to choose to continue with the renovation or impact on their lifestyle, their home, uh, and, and ultimately their work as well. Mm. Absolutely. So that's your, that's some of the mistakes. What about your biggest, I don't know, not win, but like, hey, I'm proud of that. That's a good result. Uh, look, I've, I... Um I mean, time has helped me in, in some of those things. Like, I go back and re- and I'm pretty good, revalue every now and then, and, uh, okay, that one's gone up by 100 grand. That's great. Revalue, um, get some more cash back into the offset accounts uh, so I can control that. But, uh, look, I'd, I'd say... Um, I did a little development. I've done a few small development projects. When I say small, like house on the back of a, a block of land where I've split them off, etc. cetera, uh, and... They've, I've done four of those uh, and they've actually worked quite well from an equity and cash flow point of view. Um, those have been around the Newcastle area. A couple of them I bought uh, seven or eight years ago and they've only just completed this year because I was a bit slow, but uh, we got there. <laughs> <laughs> Time probably brick helped, by helped brick, those. he's counting yeah, them. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, you count uh, them. But, um, uh, I remember probably only about the fourth or fifth or sixth property I did buy was a little unit in St Kilda uh, that was a, only about um, uh, two years old and, and it was a situation where someone, probably it was probably around the GFC, someone is just, I'm oh, liquidating everything, I'm going to lose some money on this. They've bought it early off the plan, it's not worth what they paid for it, um, they furnished it as well. I think I bought it for about $360,000 back then. It was, uh, it's very, very... A nice little spot, um, and it was rented for five hundred dollars, five hundred, five hundred and fifty dollars a week. Great start, uh, which is a great start. Yeah. It was a, it was valued at four hundred. Um, I bought it through someone I was doing depreciation schedules for. Funnily enough, having a cup of coffee, coffee talking about depreciation, he found anything around lately, and he said, "Oh, I've got this one. I'd really buy it, but I, I can't have the cash." The mail said, oh, "Okay, let's drive out and have a look." <laughs> um, so I had a bit of a better look at the area than just that, of course, um, and it had valued. 500, 600, and it's consistently rented for those numbers for for the best part of 20 years now. Um, the depreciation the first year was about $17,000 because it was a fully furnished two-year-old apartment. Um, so the the it's performed pretty well. It probably hasn't performed capitally as well as some things I've got in the portfolio, but has done a, a, a pretty good job. The other, probably another one that was, I, I bought a couple of houses with a partner around the GFC as well. Um, and we uh, adjusted that to um, from a DA that had look nine, bought a bit more nine units, bought a bit more land behind that, um, turned it into a twelve unit project, uh, and we bought it in the time of the GSC developers that are kind of required to develop, I suppose, mm. uh, to order to continue. 
Um, so the, the price that I negotiated, and I remember negotiating over that last five grand so heavily because, you know, I had no buyers, right? Mm. Um, we could buy. We were property investors that had seen an upside in development and weren't forced to do anything for a period of time. We didn't actually build it for quite a few years. Um, and I guess, you know, growth in the market helped us a little bit, but the site stacked and does fantastically well. We still own them. They rent. Um, fantastically, uh, and uh, we only built them about four years ago, mm. um, and and that's probably one of the best projects I've done from a uh, both capital value and otherwise, and and it was capitalising at a time when people who hadn't controlled their cash properly, the developers that needed to develop, they had to do something. They had this to it. do something or sell it. There's no one buying at that time in the market that wanted to develop, but. We held them as two properties that rented for not much of a loss for a period of time. And if that was all I ever did with it, I would have been not that unhappy with those um, properties as investments. I'm, a, I'm an investor that sees an upside for potential development there. And finding something like that is always one that, I guess, has the opportunity to work quite well, even on a, even on a much smaller scale than that with these houses I built on the back as yeah, well. Yeah, and your skill set helps. Yeah, as look, as so does being methodical. Uh, the, the, the quantity surveyor required to estimate construction costs for these sorts of things to crunch some numbers. Yeah. I was better than that, at that than the average bear, I suppose. Uh, <laughs> uh, I didn't have to pay someone <laughs> for that yeah, piece. Uh, always. And you still retain them today? Retain those today, yes. We, That's um, awesome. Uh, uh, with, um, uh, with the other, so with another person, that, the other guy that I did that with. Um, mm. This was, one, was my partner at BMT at the time. So um, retain those and they've worked very well. Um, so very happy with those. And... Look, I've done uh, different ones over time, and what I'd probably before that, what I'd often do is I'd try to find the, you know, the ugly duckling in a good area that I could um, renovate, you know, work out how to turn big laundries in old houses into another bedroom pretty easily. Yeah, we did. Been doing, there, done that. Yeah, yeah. like I've, I did a lot of those where you'd sort of get two bedrooms into three bedrooms, make it a nicer house. Uh, and your valuation would work well and your rental would work very well in those situations. So I did lots of those over, over time that worked, um, worked very well. And I, um, back in the days of um, – and th- these are early days without a lot of equity. So I could go and, and do um, – buy something. I would buy it, renovate it, revalue it. And back in the days when you could do 95% lens and pay the mortgage insurance, and then I'd get all of my equity back out. You'd recycle and go again. recycle and go again. Now, I had to pay mortgage insurance, which on my first property, I say one of my bigger mistakes would be saving up my deposit on the first one because I was doing it when the market was moving fast. Mm -hmm. Um, And I lost out by doing, when I say I lost out. You um, just paid more. I paid more because, I mean, the second property that I did buy, I think I paid 220,000 for 12 months ago, it was 12 months earlier, it was probably only worth 150, 160. So in, in saving that mortgage insurance premium, you've paid out a lot, lot more. But I learned from that and then I paid a lot of mortgage insurance for a few Ever years. Ever since, yeah. Because <laughs> it's a cost of business, right? Like yeah. it, it just, it's as simple as that to, to leverage. So you had your cash to go again. Exactly. Um, was, was the deal. Exactly. So you, you've said that finance really is such a key in component of investing and it, it always has been, always will be. And the property is, what did you call it? The vessel. I'm going to remember that one. <laughs> it, uh, I'm going to use that as, as my own. Boats on <laughs> yeah, that's where I was going with it. it um, so if you could give one tip, one vital piece of uh, advice, even though we don't like that word, uh, to an investor, actually two pieces of advice, one for someone who's contemplating investing and one who perhaps has started what would those two crucial bits of or tips that you'd give them? Look, read and listen as much as you can and learn as much as you can before you dive in. Um, you, you, the, the things you can learn, my, my uh, learning came from going to every property seminar under the sun. I own most property investment books that exist um, back then and still now. I don't read as many of them now. Uh, I Flick straight to the depreciation bit to see if they're um, <laughs> see if they, Do see I if, get a mention? See if, they, see if they know what they're talking about because <laughs> I judge the rest of the, the book based on that. Uh, um, but re- early days, read. And, and I mean, back in my time then, it was, it was Jan Summers probably that yeah. had the mm-hmm. books out, right? Read as many of those as you can to learn as much as you can so you can make the best informed decisions you can. Um, don't get led by um, things other than the research that you have done, the things you have learnt, or advisors that you do trust, 
you need to put these advisors around you and it's hard in this industry to find the right ones. Um, you've got to balance what they're saying with what you've learnt and read and learnt and read. Um, can I say that again? Yeah, <laughs> one more time. <laughs> and out of that comes just about everything else. The, the, yeah. the, the learning about controlling your finance property as a property investor, to me, was probably the outside of making sure you depreciate properly, um, it's probably the biggest, uh, uh, the biggest learning that allows you to control uh, the value of property you can that gives you your leverage to make your money over the long term. Yeah, good. Uh, you, you've, you've got the cash flow piece that comes out of that as well that you need to maintain and hold these properties. I've only ever sold one property in my time that I owned with partners and it was going to be an office and we got out of it. Uh, other than that, I've, even though I should sell a block of land. Uh, probably, <laughs> uh, uh, and I do have other ugly ducklings in there that haven't performed as well, right? Mm. Uh, but um, uh, So learning what you can first so you can have the informed, make informed decisions uh, followed by understanding finance as part of that learning are probably two of the most important things that, that uh, I, I'd say as my tips. Do you think um, procrastination... You can learn. You can get on the learning bandwagon for too long before you actually need to pull the trigger and put some hurt money in. You've actually, got to act. Um, and sometimes you need a prod. My learning was early. My prod came probably from my partners mm. that that found something they thought was good but didn't like the shed. I love that shed, by the way. Um, <laughs> still have that house, uh, um, uh, came as a little bit of a prod as well. You can learn forever. So, yeah, I, yeah that's a very good point uh, you make because you've also got to act. Um, but I guess part of the learning helps you not to be scared to act. Um, yeah, very true. Uh, you've got to um, – I mean, different people have different risk profiles and how much. And I'll tell you what, my risk profile at the start was not was not very high. I'm saving my 20%. Mm-hmm. Uh, and um, I tell you what, it was a whole lot different five years later because I learned more on the run was the great thing um, uh, about, uh, about finance and controlling finance because I came from no idea with that at all. Mm. Like I came from you buy your house, you pay it down. try to pay it down over your life so you've got something to retire with. And um, then you buy a boat. Uh, and then you buy a boat later. Um, <laughs> I still, um, I've, had lo- I've had boats my whole life, but I never, you know, I didn't like debt. I saved up for my first car. I uh, saved mm. up for my second car. Probably saved up for my third car. Um, but then you, you understand how to use these things properly by learning a, a, a broad range of how to run your finances. Uh, and I didn't buy the doodads, I suppose. That's rich dad, poor dad, isn't it? It is. Uh, it is. <laughs> didn't buy the doodads. That were, that were a bit more expensive until they didn't matter because the money was made out of the investing uh, uh, that I'd, and the choices I'd made earlier in, in times. I didn't travel extensively until after I bought properties. I've done a lot of travel since and I've loved it, but I didn't, you know, I had, it was great in respect to I didn't have this big quest to go over and live in Europe when I was 18 and 19 and, well, 23, I started BMT. Um, I got the bug later, which mm. was great because I made investing decisions first instead of... You made the sacrifices early. Been my, dis- yeah. my deposit would have went on a trip like that if that was the way I was inclined. So how do you, <laughs> how do you get these things both? <laughs> yeah. And last question before we wrap up. It'll be, this will be an interesting answer, I think. Do you think property is passive? Yes or no? Is it a passive investment? Oh, it's a bit of both. <laughs> That's a bit on the fence, isn't it? Um, the good thing is a lot of it is passive. Um, it's predominantly passive in respect to I can go to sleep and if capital growth is happening, it still happens. So that piece of it is passive. But you need to actively make sure you are getting the best out of it in order to make uh, order for it to perform over time. I've been more passive than you should in things like holding on to things that I probably shouldn't have. But they haven't stop me from investing in other things is the, is the only reason I probably haven't. Mm. Um, could that money have been used better for other things uh, that have made more money in that time? Hindsight's wonderful. Uh, but um, I think most of the work that's done can be fairly passive. Uh, but, you know, poking your nose in and making sure that they're doing the best they can is active. So you've got a combination of both. Sorry to give you a... No, that's, a good, that's actually a good answer because it's kind of what we go on about <laughs> right. as well. Yeah, the growth might be passive, but you can accentuate it with a renovation, a bit of sweat equity. and But you need to control this beast because it is... You need to stay a, invested in it. Yeah, because there's so many moving parts that's to right. it until you get to a point in time where you can have support. There it is. Thanks, Brad. Thanks, guys. Great to be here. It, uh, Talk a bit about a f- past and stories. <laughs> well, I think people want to know that too. Like, you know, we get asked how we started and what mm-hmm. we did, and I thought, well, you know what? 
let's see what Brad Beer, how he started and, and how he's continued on because it's, it's a tangible thing. So thanks again for coming in. And any questions that you do have in and regards and around depreciation, how can they, how can they get a hold of you? Oh, easy. Uh, email. Uh, it's bradley.beer at bmtqs.com.au. Um, I, it's only, I <laughs> his emails will blow up now. Oh, thanks, Steve. Uh, we, we, that's, that's fine. And, and look, Website bmtqs.com.au. Um, I'm I'm easy to find by Google. My mobile's not hidden uh, <laughs> too too well. Uh, the, the 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 team can help with many of the questions, but I'm I'm around. I'm still heavily active in the business, talking about depreciation every day. So uh, um, very easy to find us. And check out that prop calc calc you later. That makes sense <laughs> it, um, <laughs> because it is pretty good, and uh, we're actually working on getting that onto our uh, onto our website so people can have a play around with it as well. Vic, yeah, but it was excellent information, Brad, and um, uh, good insight to how your portfolios morphed over time. And um, uh, I think the biggest take I got from from that was you had all the knowledge, you had all the information, but it actually took you uh, the first deal to actually get you going because then you realize that it wasn't that hard and it was just methodical and uh, you pr- put all of your knowledge in place and i think the uh, listeners will absolutely um, love the uh, backstory of bradley beer the um, uh, ceo of bmt and um, uh, if there are any questions certainly reach out on questions at rightpropertygroup.com.au and that's it we've gone a little over time so thanks for listening uh Make sure you also check out the socials. We're doing the fortnightly uh, live Facebook live, Facebooks lives, Facebook lives, uh, and of course the other uh, podcasts that we do that don't have the visual, just the audio. Make sure you tune in, and we will see you next fortnight. The information featured in this podcast is general in nature, does not take into consideration your financial situation or individual needs and should not be relied upon. Before making any investment, insurance, tax, property or financial planning decision, you should consult a licensed professional who can advise whether your decision is appropriate for you.